talk about OS test usage and production component. Mm -hmm. We're not going to talk much about the unit testing per se. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this talk is to show how OS test components can be used in actual production environment for the actual non test related purposes. Mm -hmm. So, but the uh, first part is smaller, and it does cover uh, some. Uh, coordination between uh, production code and uh, unit test code, specifically um, how they can exist together in the same uh, environment. Uh, this is not about how you write test cases, not about how you uh, uh, build them, but uh, mostly about test organization. How do you organize your unit test? How do you uh, make them live uh, along with your production code? And it's this, I don't say that I, this is how you should do it. I'm not trying to say you know, this is best practice. Each approach, I'm gonna, a couple approaches I'm going to show you have, both have pluses and minuses. But I um, uh, just want you to, to be aware of it. So the first most common <coughs> scenario is probably most library developers who use Boost Test. Uh, familiar with where you have library which has a blue directory, source directory and somewhere nearby test directory all separate and uh, having their own uh, allocation. Uh, this, uh, in this case, <coughs> the unit tests usually look like, like something like this. You have uh, uh, include, you have uh, define your, your test module and then you have your own library and then here's the test cases, right? So nothing special. We're not going to incur showing examples of this use case. Uh, this use case has some obvious pros and cons. Uh, cons. Uh, uh, clear separation of production code and test code, which is for many uh, for many people is class. And uh, test code doesn't affect your uh, production code in any way, no compilation time, no runtime size effect. Uh, and um, on the con side, there is the same statement that the clear separation of test code and production code in some, some scenarios, some find that inconvenient, and so especially if you initially do initial development. So you have got to do have one Windows in library, one Windows in unit test, and you need to switch between them, or maybe some tabs within <coughs> your development environment. Maybe you need to build one library, then build your unit test, so the extra build step. Not necessarily a big deal, but just slight annoyance. Um, so here I'd like to introduce you to some alternative usage scenario where you have kind of a test and TST uh, living uh, under the same roof but uh, kind of a different in parallel universe if you want. Uh, uh, is it done? Uh, it's good for small projects and uh, good when you do an initial development for the library. So you, oh, on, again, this directory structure is probably going to be like your library includes source. There is a make file, but as you know, there is no test directory here, right? So, um, the test f uh, file in this case is going to look slightly different. Um, you have your library implementation followed in the same source file, but if they have unit test, do the unit test. Well, whatever you, all the, your test cases right there. So, uh, when you would do something like this, when you do initial development, you would develop your code and you can define, see this unit test macro here? So if you define it, your, uh, your library can build it as a unit test immediately. And when you're ready to release your library, you just not define unit test and it's, you can uh, build it uh, as a library. And here I can show you, this is easy to show an example. So here's the include source. and. Uh, uh, we can uh, build this as a test. <coughs> um, this is a common line. You know this is unit test. Uh, this is what all, all I wanted to show. This is for Windows exactly the same as we can do for... Uh, so when you build the test, it will uh, run, the, uh, run in the, within the minute you'll have something you can immediately run. You don't need to build the library separately. Uh, once uh, you're done with the changes, you can. Uh, uh, this is pretty, very simple. Uh, just test. It doesn't do much. It have two unit, uh, two test cases, some fake library with implementation of source. 
but uh, you can run it and, uh, and here you go, there's two test cases run and execute it, right? And once it's done, you can run a different, well in this case a different command and always a different <coughs> target and make file and you, you build your library, right? So uh, here we go. Uh, this approach has some pros and cons. Uh, it has tight integration, which is both pros and cons, if I get for some. Yeah, and uh, you don't need separate build step. Uh, it doesn't affect your library code and runtime, so because it's compiled out permanently, and when you're ready to go. <coughs> okay, but it has uh, <coughs> obvious cons because uh, the library is uh, a test code or it's in your source, so you may change may they change the unit test. You need to compile the library. Well, no, it may not be necessarily necessary, but. Uh, uh, when you build your unit test, you're also building your library code, which is again, if you didn't make any changes to the library, just want to rebuild unit test, then it's a positive side. But it is a uh, usage scenario you should be familiar with. Uh, finally, there's another uh, there's usage scenario I want to show you where your unit test is actually exists and available in your production code. This is mostly interesting for the users who develop the library and then deploy it to the server to the client, there's a client uses in some the environment, and they, sometimes there is need to oh, this something doesn't work. I want to run unit tests in my library in a client production environment. So there's various ways to do it. You can deploy unit tests along with the library, or you can make unit tests part of the library. And this is how <laughs> you do it. So again, there's no test directory separate. Um, in this case, uh, you need to build, well, this assumes that you build in shared libraries, like the LLOSOs, and you need to link with the post test shared library as well. And you need to define this init function. It doesn't really matter. <coughs> it should be external as a symbol. Uh, Name init unit test. Uh, so no, no, there is no if def. It's just this code will exist in production. So how will you run this unit test? The, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, you build your library. Uh, um, as usual, and then to invoke, you use this in production, but when you want to invoke unit tests, you use some kind of external test runner. I show you an example of the one provided by with boost test, which is called console test runner, with your test library, and uh, I have an example like this. So here's the console test runner, here's the library, I already built it in this case. So you can uh, console test runner, Here's the command line, you run it, and it executes. And exactly the same executable as you run it in production. You take this library and it, you execute it uh, as unit test. Um, this approach has, again, pros and cons. I'm not saying it's all optimal. The pros that you have direct integration of, you can run it in production environments is the biggest pros in this scenario. If you want to, if you want to do it, this is how you do it, essentially. Oh, and the, on the opposite side, you know, uh, you make the changes as usual. In the most, and I like the previous examples. In this case, unit tests are part of your production libraries that might affect the size of it. But usually, this is not a problem. It's very small and not essential. Any questions at this part? So um, this essentially covers everything that related to testing. The second part was a presentation of uh, direct uh, relation to the testing or unit testing. So uh, for this, uh, in this part, I would like to cover several subjects. Uh, some of them are I want to call experimental, and I prepared them specifically for for you for the presentation and uh, for the next episode of boost test. <coughs> but um, I'll try to cover some existing solutions that you can use and uh, something new that I came up with. So um, we will cover the program execution monitor, which is what uh, if you are using boost test probably you're familiar with or well heard of it. We're going to cover uh, some underlying component called execution monitor and some debugger interfaces, uh, which are in I think uh, well, we, might, we might find useful in some scenarios. Uh, Floyd <coughs> point comparison of keys, 
whose test is using, who's testing, but uh, there's no reason for you not to use it in some production code if you need to. It's not some not rocket science, but it's still uh, there's some uh, existing uh, algorithm which you can find useful. Testing tools, slightly different view on the testing tools, how they actually, is there any place for testing tools in production code? And uh, if I have time, we all have some, I have some tools for hidden utils, this was in boost test. So we'll start with probably the simplest out of this, which is production execution monitor. This is a very simple but powerful tool. If you, this, if you, if what it does is what you need. Uh, essentially, um, I found myself using it in couple scenarios where I was asked to do support to sort of legacy library or like leg legacy application, sorry, and uh, uh, it's some it crashes for some differently for some unknown reason in different scenarios, and I um, needed to just make sure this first works. I'll deal with the errors later. Just needed to just have some unif uniform output out of it. So just if it's fail. Why, how it fell, if it's worked, uh, that's good. So the par program execution monitor helps users and it leaves them from this error detection and reporting duties. So I added, most importantly, the reports errors uniformly. And uh, it's not very configurable. This, if you need some, do some, some smart with application build to read some errors in a special way, probably I'm better off with a different components of boosters, but uh, it's uh, the biggest perk of this component. It only needs just two lines of code to change to start using it. And that's, and that's all simple. So here's an example. So you're getting an application which does something, doesn't really matter what. It's your main and it executes something which sometimes fails. All you need to do to start using program execution monitor, change the name and include the header. And that's it. The application uh, is a uh, safer and better citizen, uh, especially if it runs in some automated tool. Um, uh, I can show you an example again. It's, um, so here is some implementation of your application, but I'm not even go there. I want to show you the old main, as we just see, and the new main, as I just described. You change two lines of code to change, so I can build old and uh, I can run it and it will start failing. Uh, hope it's not failing. It's uh, uh, based on random number. So. Uh, so uh, it shows a window and uh, in many uh, environments it's not very nice thing way to report and the Windows is prone to do this. Uh, especially if you use in the background time environment, can show you uh, different errors. And this is different error errors. It, it actually doesn't show much about the information, uh, about much about the error. Actually, this is a different error from the one you've seen before. Mm -hmm. So now uh, we are uh, using um, in building a new main, launch changes to the implementation of the application at this point yet. Um, so when we can run and we see uh, uniform output here we go. So there's something somewhere uh, cause integer divided by zero. And there's no windows, no nothing. Uh, and it will work. Okay, this is some exception was uh, thrown. This is the exception was propagated. And you can uh, should be able to cause memory access relation as well. Oh here it is. So here is memory access relation that showed m m much more information that you've seen from uh, previous. And most importantly, this uh, always a uniform output. Um, so when is it good for? When you <coughs> run in libraries which are un unattended. So imagine this is Windows produced by some demo de uh, demo application or some uh, cron job or something that you don't really have a human to press in, uh, on a, on a body. Uh, some legacy programs you're not really in the mood to fix yet, but you still want to make them behave, behave them nicely. Uh, in general, it's good for any environment where any uniform error reporting is good. Uh, 
depending on what's your use case. Uh, it may not be that applicable if you uh, need more con control, right? So if you want, like, uh, maybe you know, do automatic, automatic restart, treat some errors differently, report them into some uh, log. This is uh, whatever you want to do, right? Uh, if you want to do unit test again, you're probably better off with unit test framework. This is not, you can use it, but it's probably not ideal uh, tool. Uh, uh, so the way to use it, uh, as I just described, it's called uh, it's a static library. You link with a static library. You, well, you include the header, but you only need to link with a static library. There are two more usage variants. If you want, you can use a simple header usage variant. All those test components on a level component have which is this single header, shared library, and static library usage variants. The same is for a program execution monitor. So you have included. Choose a different header and you don't have to use any library. It actually, that, this component is not very expensive for a couple of files to be included. Um, and you can also link the, uh, with a shared library, but for that you need to define pull static dynamically. Either here in front of your header, or you can do it in make, make file. Uh, program execution monitor as well as unit test framework. They are uh, both um, come as, uh, as a layer design of boost test where this execution monitor, uh, execution monitor on top, on bottom, sorry, and, uh, and program execution monitor are based on top of execution monitor. So where execu program execution monitor is a simple straightforward to use, but not very configurable. Execution monitor, on the other hand, much more configurable, much more powerful, and can be used in much uh, wider range of well, um, use cases. Uh, more information about this is available online, so the documentation, if you're interested, but uh, we'll now jump to the execution monitor, which is... Uh, so, of the three cases before, why would you want to use shared or static? Why not just the, the middle one of just including a, a, a .h file? Well, the user, usual reasons, if you um, find that for some reason, well, the program execution monitor includes execution monitor, which includes lots of stuff, system headers. Potentially, it's slightly low. With the current hardware, frankly, I don't see <laughs> it's not built like it would usually. But uh, uh, if you find it for some reason too long, you can build a link with a static. <coughs> And on the other hand, you have hundreds of applications. Each <coughs> link in the static library, you might find, oh, I don't want to link all of them, just want to share link. So you showed a couple of examples that uh, catches all the exceptions. It checks for uh, segmentation fault, and uh, the third one was? Well, um, uh, uh, exception, fault and point exception. Uh, <coughs> so do you think it's also useful in Linux when you already used to use core dumps or debug with core dumps? Um, well, the program execution monitor will not produce a core error, right. so, but you know, the execution monitor will allow you, if necessary, and again, it will have an option to either produce a core error or not produce a core error. Right. Yeah, I found an additional feature useful is that the, in debug mode it uh, detects memory leaks. On Windows. On uh, Windows. Oh, only on Windows. Uh, okay. Uh, on Windows, yes. But it's still useful. <laughs> Uh, and um, <coughs> well, I'll uh, return to this point a little bit later when I go and cover the debugger interfaces. Um, so execution monitor is uh, the component which lies underneath every other major component of boost test, and uh, it performs. Uh, it is a component responsible. It's very generic mm -hmm. component responsible for execution of anything really, any functions, any piece of code in some monitored environment. You want to make sure that this code, probably this is some party function, which you have no, have no idea what it's doing, right? You want to make sure that it doesn't crash your application. You want to make sure that it's, uh, uh, essentially, you want to run it in a, some kind of sandbox. And this is where execution monitor comes. Um, it's a, a rather versatile. You can use it in, use it in, different, in different ways. And you can fine tune it to match whatever needs you have. So the design rationale for this component 
uh, we included the uniformity. It's very big design national. You want the re reporting to be very uniform, whatever errors. Windows, Linux, FreeBSD, whatever, Mac. The errors always reported the same way. You can uh, write the application <coughs> and deal with them uniformly. Uh, it tries to report as much as possible for a given error. So, and it tries to allow you to, uh, to be flexible, to allow you to tweak whatever you want to tweak. If you want to run with a floating point exception enabled or disabled, if you want to have a timeout or not for the uh, uh, function to be in, being executed. And the, so another very big point was its port portability. It's supposed to work everywhere, and as far as I know it is, it does. Well, almost everywhere. <laughs> for the all uh, also for the all platforms build uh, boost is building on it works and the stability which means that uh, it doesn't it should be written in a way that it should work even if we have like out of memory condition something very bizarre going on it should try to be stable it doesn't crash so it, the information it collected is actually returned back to the user and the user can do something. So the, uh, this is the most trivial example you can imagine how most execution modules can be used. So here is the you can shade there, get an instance, and say I want to execute this function. I have no idea what the, uh, what's it doing. The uh, error uh, always is being reported through an exception here, so most execution <coughs> exception. And then you can just use error code and error message, you can log. Uh, switch on the, uh, the error code, do whatever you want. I can show this you right here. So this is just an example I've showed you. Uh, in this case, it's uh, showing some error. <laughs> so, yep. And execute. Okay. Here's the report. The bottom code exception. This brings some error. Again, if you can uh, <coughs> have a different variant, different uh, error if you want. Uh, we build it, execute it, and again, it's a memory access violation. There are here, I'll update, attempt to read the uh, accessible data. Uh, it depends on the platform, it reports more information, less information, depends on Many variables, uh, Windows, Linux, uh, depends on the time environment, but uh, we'll try to report as much as possible. Stack trace is in a kind of to do phase. Uh, well, I've tried, uh, again, this portability is the biggest stumbling point. Uh, but the whole, oh, but again, we get to the debug, I'll probably show this one as well. Do you want to phrase so the interface, the interface consists of several components. The execution exception, which is an error you're getting, the actual error occurred. The execution monitor itself. And a couple uh, additional interfaces. Uh, one is execution aborted. And this is when you want to gracefully abort execution without generating any errors. This one is aborted. I know what I'm doing, essentially. And two. Uh, new interfaces, which you may not, well, this one you find, but this one you will not find in the current uh, release of the uh, step, but it is going to be uh, released right like after this session, session. So the first one is a floating point exception management interface, and the second is a debugger interface. We'll cover, uh, cover it a little bit more details now. Um, <coughs> execution exception, nothing fancy here, really, just error code, string, with the error message and the location where it occurs. Um, we rarely can have a location, but if, for example, you're using boost exception, you will get a location. So if your code reduces boost exception, and somehow it was uh, wasn't coded, we can get it through, and I will be able to report location. I'll be able to report location in some other, not that many use cases. Uh, I guess I said, I'll try to report as much as possible. The execution have an error code. This is the switch. If you want to switch based on this error code, you'll be able to. Usually, if it's a like system error, or fatal system error, you will want to abort immediately. Like show window to your user. 
uh, had recently very interesting discussion with my with the production team in the JT. They wanted to continue to operate, even if it was structured exception. So we are, I am using this in production code with JP Morgan. So. Uh, so it is being used. Uh, so, uh, but my usual recommendation, if it's a system error, fatal system, fatal system error, you just you can do something after that. But usually, abort after that. Uh, the execution monitor, the configuration part, comes from using up uh, properties. So, you see, the instance. If you remember the example. There was the first grade in the instance, then you run. So when you create an instance, you cannot uh, modify properties of this execution model. There are, at this point, five, I think there's going to be another one soon. And the first one is the catch system errors, and it's a Boolean property, which says whether or not you actually want to catch fatal system errors by memory access violation. So if you want a corridor, you will set it to false. If you don't want, if you want a uniform error report, you want to jump deal with it a different way, you set it to true. Detect floating point exception. Uh, this is actually twofold. Like it is bullet, but it is unsigned flag, if you can see. Well, why is it unsigned? Because not only it turns them on and off, it also allows uh, a mask specifying which particular floating point exception you're interested in. I will show you in a moment uh, the possible values. But you, have, you, have, you can fine tune. I want only overflows in my code. If it's a financial application, sometimes you want division by zero in order, sometimes you, know, you want it to run. Uh, timeout. Uh, timeout effectively uh, reliably only works on the Unixes. Uh, there is no real implementation for the timeout on the Windows at this point. There is one which I can, uh, um, I am using for the for the GP, uh, which is based on essentially running, what it does is the execution monitor will run your function in a separate thread and then uh, will cancel, try to cancel it. Uh, but uh, if uh, when you, on uh, Unix, you can continue writing, essentially you just, if it's timeout, okay, or whatever, I can continue. On Windows, if it's timeout, usually means that this thread, I cannot really cancel that thread, so it means that if it's timeout, oh, it's time to die. It's an end, so I'm wondering what happens if you put it something in there. Uh, not sure. Uh, I think uh, it's checked that it's positive. Again, this is the next flag is more applicable for the new Unixes. Uh, obviously, the execution monitor installs uh, signal handlers. So if you want uh, more reliable, in some scenarios, it's more reliable way to handle them if you catch them in an alternative in a different stack. Uh, and this is how you set, set, it, set it to true and it will catch the alternative stack. And uh, the last option is the funny one. Um, uh, the boost test debugger interface sometimes allow, will allow you to automatically attach the debugger uh, immediately in a point where the uh, exception, uh, error, <laughs> <is the> error <laughs> So you got memory access violation. And if you set it to true, uh, Oops, and the debugger pops up. I can try to show you some examples of it. Work nicely in some scenarios, not that much. And it's been added. Uh, another very important part of the uh, configuration interface with the execution monitor is the exception to slate, so translations. You can um, register if you, own your, if you have your own exception. Like, for, for example, you've had boost Python. And you, you know, sometimes it throws this weird exception error already set. So you want to know, okay, I want to run this code, but if error already set is thrown, I want to deal with it in my own way. I, I want to get to the Python, dig out the actual error that was produced, and, and then actually not fail and do something else. Maybe I just mark it. I don't want an exception being thrown at this, at this point. So you can do this through the register exception translator interface. So you, you produce, um, here's an exception type you want to register it for. And uh, this actual latest, latest edition is that you can actually associate a string tag with, uh, with this exception translator. I will explain why you need one in a moment. And uh, you need one is exactly to be able to erase, by the way, 
uh, you can register as many exceptions as later as you want. Essentially, it's for users like uh, structure when one inside the another inside the other. So you have can have as many different <coughs> exceptions as later as you want. Uh, at the same time, if you want in some scenarios, you want to erase exceptions as later. There's a need for that. Again, I have before came up came from my own personal experience. Um, Imagine that you have some global execution monitor which is used to, treat, to handle your uh, to handle running some strange code. And you have some libraries being loaded dynamically. So you're loading them then then like you unload them. You're loading them, you unload them. So if you somehow when you load the library, okay, this library actually generates a new type of exception and it says I want my exception to be treated in this way. So it registers itself. <coughs> Uh, some custom exception translator. But then you unload the library and the exception translator become <coughs> deadly somewhere. So before you unload a library, you actually want to array the exception translator for that exception. So that uh, uh, there is no trace uh, of this exception remains anymore. Um, I'm just wondering why would be just putting something in a try catch block in the function that you're testing not be sufficient? Why? Why do you need to have a special exception translator thing? Well, again, take a boost Python exception. Extremely inconvenient. You have know, this boost Python code. We're using it very extensively. It's all around the place. If I will need to every single statement around the boost Python to wrap with the try catch, try catch will might make my code really unpleasant. But I'm saying not. So just put it in like you, you test. The execution monitor tests one function. It's basically wrapping one function. Mm -hmm. So why not put a try catch block? For it is possible function? to do it that way. Sometimes um, uh, this, you, you have no control of that, that function. Maybe some other <coughs> somebody else function. And uh, you know sometimes it produces this kind of exception. You want it to be treated some special way. You can do it just by having try catch around the whole function you being uh, <coughs> that being executed. And you can register an exception translator. It's being used extensively boost Python itself, by the way. I'm a little confused about where the translation occurs. <coughs> translation occurs after the fact, so the exception is thrown. Right. And before it got to the guts, where the, for example, if there were no exception uh, translator, for the almost unknown exception, I'll just report something happened, unknown exception was thrown. But here you can report some custom message, whatever you want to report for this particular exception. And uh, exception occur after the exception is thrown. And if you don't re-throw anything from it, you can re-throw something else from the translator. But unless, if you do, it, this new exception is going to be caught by execution monitor and reported. But if not, if we just this exception translator exits, well, your function will essentially we exit with error code, but it will not throw an execution exception. So the arrays, you can erase it by string tag, which is was used when you register it, or you can try to erase it by the, uh, exception type, but this will require, this will only work if, if RTTI is enabled. So you can, uh, this is was two ways to erase it. Floating point exception, uh, floating point management interfaces. Um, the, there is no standard at this point about uh, for this interface. So this is my essentially my attempt to have portable standard for the interface like this. The Windows have its own interfaces. Linux is uh, on on as is um, uh, what I don't remember the exact name of standard, which into, yeah, um, C standard, which has some form of FP uh, accept enable or FP accept a whole bunch of interfaces there. But they're not exactly what we need here. We wanted to enable disable particular floating point exception type. And there is no this an extension to the C which has this interface. And I'm using it as part of the implementation area. But there is no portable interfaces available anywhere and this is what it is. So um, it's enable and disable. So you say, I want to enable this and disable it. Uh, this is kind of exception you can enable, disable. Division by zero, an exact, 
invalid overflow, underflow, all of them, and just in an invalid mask, which is sometimes returned. If it, for example, uh, if this function fails, it will return you invalid. Otherwise, it will return you previous values of the uh, exception flex. Let's give you an example. I'm not sure. Uh, debugger. Debugger is in another area which is not, there's no standard for it. And this is my <laughs> attempt to introduce some kind of portable standard for it. And at this point, I have a file function, uh, the stack handling, which probably go in the same list. And it would show you, uh, usually, the stack information is not available. It's not non debugger environment anyway. So it's reasonable to expect it to be interface to debugger or some prior debugger program database. Um, so the interface is here uh, is under debugger, which essentially simply <coughs> functionally uh, says whether or not you're currently under debugger. Not, not, not much than that. No more than that. Um, you can uh, do report errors differently. You under the bugger or not? Just one <coughs> option. The bugger break. The same, uh, if you run in an application and you want to uh, introduce the bugger break at this point, it's not widely useful, but uh, sometimes you want to do this. And um, again, attach the bugger. You want at this point attach the bugger. You run in some application which fails but very rarely, and you want to continue make it run and say. When you fail, please attach the debugger. I want to see the stack at this point. It's, it's uh, essentially alternative to not having the function to show you stack. It says, I want to attach the debugger immediately when it fails at, at this point. Uh, these two functions, uh, uh, again, my time to, pull, to have some portable memory link interfaces. <coughs> uh, it only really works for the window, as we see in our time at this point. So it says, debug on and off to debug memory links. And uh, here is the last function it says, I want to break when a particular memory location occurs. I wanna, uh, and this is a, an essential index. It's, I want to break on 125th allocation of memory. Because uh, this, uh, when you turn on memory links, one part of the report is uh, that shows this index allocation order number, which was uh, which linked. Uh, unfortunately, not exactly can be used straight like that because if you run it, it's a detect memory leaks. It will show you, like, for example, memory leaks with allocation number 20. But then when you say, okay, break on memory allocation 20, breaks on different memory location uh, because it's going to work slightly different, does it? different, but it's definitely not a number close to that. Plus minus. Usually it's plus. For more allocation curves. Okay, here we got some uh, examples. So we can, um, examples for the catch system error. So here we've got a um, function which goes in memory, memory leak, oh, no, memory. Uh, memory access violation right here. And uh, I'm saying execution monitor, I want to catch system exception, uh, system errors. And uh, I can see that if I build it and run, I'm getting this report, right? So now let's see if what will happen if I switch it to false. build it, I run it, and uh, essentially it will uh, show you the bugger on usual, usual Windows window. On, uh, on the Unix it will show you core down, something like core down. Right? Uh, the next example I would like to show you is here. We are uh, having the have a different floating point exception. So it's a, and the board, on, on the top, we've got a division by zero. Here we've got inexact, essentially. Here we've got underflow. 
or with all points. This is uh, an in integer division by zero. Uh, integer division by zero on Windows is actually not floating point exception. On the Unix, it is floating point exception. On Linux, it's not. So uh, it has to be dealt a little bit differently. So here we say, okay, first uh, uh, test, well, the first example shows me, I want to detect division by zero exclusively. And I write the first function. The fun second function, I want to say, I want to run the uh, test. I want to catch inexact and overflow. And we're running the second function. So this, so in this case, I want to catch all floating point exceptions. And I run that function. And finally, at the bottom, I want to run uh, integer division by zero. But in this case, I have to set cache system errors to true. Otherwise, it will see the system system error. Um, so if we, I think it's pre built already. So I run it. And here, <coughs> what it produces, 40 point divided by zero. The result of floating point operation cannot be represented exactly. All the, all the errors we expected it to show shown, shown up. Um, so everything is okay. It's expected. What is expected? Uh, the next is out of stern bugger. Uh, um, so here we've got um, function again, member access relation that says I want to automatically start the bugger at this point. Uh, it works a little bit differently on Unixes, but um, here, let's see if I execute it. I think that it's supposedly should start the bugger. <coughs> While it's starting the debugger, I can show you the timeout. As I said, it's primarily Unix, so uh, there is um, here's my, um, <coughs> we got FreeBSD here. So in this case, the function which will slip for three seconds, I have a timeout for two seconds. I can run it, oh. and it says connect. It okay, says so signal, signal alarm, timeout while executing the function. We can, uh, this is a mild, mild exception if you want to use it. Just can, you can continue after that. <coughs> so this guy is not going to do anything. Uh, well, it's uh, supposed to show you. Uh, Windows uh, debugger wi selection window, and it will say attach the debugger, and that's it. I'm not sure why it's not working at this point. But wasn't that much. Um, uh, exception registration. So here we've got an example with uh, two exceptions exception one, exception two. I've got two functions which to translate each exception, and then I have two functions to generate each exception. And here what we do. The first example, I register both translators, both exceptions, and I run, and I run more, more, both of my functions. And they will supposedly, uh, they should successfully, well, successfully execute both functions, meaning that the execution exceptions will not be generated in this case. So we should reach this line. <coughs> uh, then we can remove one translator, and if I generate uh, this exception, we should not reach this one anymore. And then we should see some kind of uh, but different error notification for this exception. I can remove, again, the first exception as well, different in this case, so the type. And again, it should not be, um, should not reach the line. So, as expected, the first two exceptions were caught and reported properly. We reach the line as expected. And then the last two examples, we just reported code exception unknown type. I don't know what to do with this. But it, it wasn't. I caught the exception. The application didn't crash on uh, it. The final example on this page is the bugger interface. 
So what we do here is a debugger break. <coughs> uh, the most, the best way to show it is how to run. It's from uh, <coughs> from the debugger itself, uh, but it, it should show or not running not under the debugger and running under the debugger and otherwise. Um, this example will be available for you, so you can play with it. Well, this is a uh, because. This is a debugger break. Uh, if, um, it will um, show you the window, and I'll attach the debugger, and you'll see that it shows it says user breakpoint, saying this is user asked to break, uh, to break this point. And by the way, it does it show that we are not under the debugger yet. But if we would compile a test and run it, run it from debugger, it will show run it under. The under debugger uh, have a completely different implementation on every platform I'm trying to do. I had some success on some versions of Linux. Not much success on FreeBSD, unfortunately. I cannot show you an example on Linux. Because the broad subsystem, I've tried to build it. I don't know, for some reason, the debugger doesn't start. Visual Studio doesn't start. Show what's that. Uh, but uh, it doesn't work usually. <laughs> uh, okay, let's move on. So we've covered the example for execution monitors. Uh, there is um, something more you can play with it if you want. This is actually most of the uh, usage possible usage scenarios. Uh, how you would use it, uh, how you apply it in your in your code. Uh, use, usually it requires one or two headers, the execution monitor, HPP. Definitely one is well correct. If you want a debugger interfaces, you include this header. And the implementation is in two IPP files here and here. There is no um, maybe you want to say that. I wanted to ask is there not uh, for included? No, uh, there is no included there is no included version of execution monitor. I probably should add one. And there is no targets in gem file at this point to build in your libraries. This is just really all you need to make a video. Uh, loading point comparison routines. Uh, just, um, this is another uh, feature of Boost Test. And it was uh, discussed how it should be done, it, depending on your perspective, if you're an expert in the field, or if you just. Uh, Married user <coughs> has different opinions, but uh, the idea um, is very simple, based on some algorithms in the, from the Knut, Knut, from the book of uh, Knut, and uh, it's a very small header, comparatively small header, but it's very small. You have no dependencies other than uh, no dependencies from the mesh from uh, uh, inside anyway else inside the boost very lightweight they're in existing version in currently in the release uh, this slide dependency on uh, predicate results so generate uh, not boolean but the predicate result structure which is both boolean and the message containing necessary information about the error but as a version of, uh, well, I'm showing you does not have it anymore. I've completely split it up, so it's completely separate in, in, in the interfaces usable and actually there's no dependence on any and very very efficient in this. So the interface I've put I've put is the same. There's a uh, the post from um, uh, anyway. Uh, there was post recently on mailing list for some other doing similar effort and he. Did it under mass, so I also put it under mass FPC namespace. So did a, a couple uh, one enum which specifies the strengths of the comparison. If 
you're familiar with the algorithm, essentially you can compare the, if you compare two values, how close they are, you can say the difference, uh, fraction of this difference is less than tolerance related to the first number and le less than different uh, related to the second number. And this is strong comparison. Or you can say it's close enough, it's close at least to the one of them. Well, less than tolerance for at least one of them. So this is strong and weak. There is a two uh, functions, uh, two classes that can be used to do when I, with all the parameters, I'll show you in a second how they define. The closest at tolerance is uh, essentially you can construct an instance of it and use it as a predicate to perform all your tests. If you need to do it over and over, you can create it once and test it. But the temple that buys a floating point type, <coughs> it can be an any floating point type, like float and double, or it can be some user defined floating point type as well. <coughs> this algorithm should work as well. Here's the function, this is the functor. Is operate on two floating point values. You can also ask for the fraction tolerance. Is, is it being used? Um, it <coughs> can be actually different from the tolerance using constructor. I'll explain you why in a second. And the strength, whether or not it was strong or weak. So uh, you can ask why this is a template. So why this tolerance is not defined as, as the same <coughs> floating point type as the type of the values we're going to compare. And the reason, again, it is a very long discussion, long standing discussion about how do you define the tolerance. Uh, experts in this field usually say it should be defined as a fraction tolerance, and that's it. But even to state A close to B is a fraction tolerance of 0 0.1 is unclear. As much as well. Mary, you that are especially not expert in this field, it's much simpler to say. A should be close to B, it doesn't, shouldn't differ from B for more than 1%. It's a very simple statement, most of the people understand it. And uh, so I uh, think that we should be able to say, I want a tolerance as a 1%. There's another option actually for defining the tolerances, which I'll cover in a moment as well. So for that reason, this is a template, so that you can have a different type of tolerance. And it, uh, you could deal with it, well, it's slightly different. Uh, so there's this tolerance traits uh, where you can say for this tolerance type, this is how you convert from this tolerance type to the fraction tolerance and from the fraction tolerance back to the actual tolerance. So you need to do a conversion, this simple traits class. And I also define the percent tolerance mm -hmm. and the uh, traits for it and the uh, object the functions. And uh, I'll show an example of how to use it. So I think I skipped one example and I'll show you boss. So here's an example of uh, closed tolerance. So you can see we, uh, we create an instance. There's a predicate we're going to use. In this case, I'm using fraction tolerance, one tenth. Let's say I want to compare these two values, these two values, and these two values. This should be close. This is actually more than one tenth fraction tolerance. And this is, even though it lands in one tenth, is a, it's still going to fail because nothing is close to zero. The idea is that you know, the algorithm is nothing is close to zero. You need to do use a different predicate to compare close to, close to zero. Okay, so and then I can show you the fraction tolerance. So I can run this. It's expected the first function of uh, six. It's true, false, false, fraction total is 0 0.1, the comparison is strong. And now let's see an example where the, here I'm using percent tolerance. I say I want these numbers to be at 5% difference. Again, this should succeed, this should fail, this should fail. The, the fraction total should show me the actual fraction total is being used. One zero zero is expected. Fraction total is zero point zero five. This is five percent. And comparison strength is strong. Okay. There's another way to define the tolerance. Is a units of ULP. Uh, if you want to say, 
I want the numbers to be close within 10 units of EOP. It's, I believe this should be possible as well. We just need to define different over its type, define the traits, define specific, uh, explicit specialization of the traits. And it worked. I didn't do it. I'm open to suggestion if it makes sense. Uh, if it is, I think we should be done. We should, we should do it. Uh, this slight uh, issue with how we, we identify EOP, which headers we depend on for that. So these, um, I just described the interface where we kind of create a predicate and reuse it over and over, but in many cases you just want to do it once, I want to create an instance of an object, so you just use it if this function is closed to, where you have a compared to types and it specifies the tolerance. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> I can show you an example. <coughs> As well, all this example worked both on Linux, Linux and Windows, so I just showed you from the Windows. <coughs> okay, so again, there's a five percent tolerance, and here's how you compare. Uh, actually, sorry, this line should be here. Uh, it's close to. In this case, I'm using fraction tolerance. One. Uh, in this case, I'm using percent tolerance. I think it's actually the same. And in this case. And compare it with zero, and it is close to again, will fail if you try to say if it's a value close to zero. Okay, one, one, zero is expected. These two most true. This is exactly the same. Uh, this is a very small number, this is a very small number, but uh, they are close with this percent tolerance, uh, fraction tolerance. These two numbers do not. Uh, close a uh, difference between less than 5%, so less than, uh, sorry, 0.1%, even though they are huge numbers. And uh, this is not close to zero, even though it's a very small number. It's, uh, you can't use the close to, uh, change closeness to zero or for smallness of the number. For that, you need to use a different. And here's what you, you would use in this case the small distortions. In this case, um, the tolerance is absolute. So you want to say it's small or less than this number, whatever it is. And uh, this is a predicate, a reusable predicate. And this is a function we would use uh, a <coughs> streamlined function with no object being created. So here's an example. In this example, we say, okay, this is the predicate well, I call rather small, with this absolute predicate, uh, absolute tolerance. Yeah, this is absolute tolerance. And here I'm using this predicate to, you, to check the smallness of these two numbers. Obviously, the first should fail, this should pass. And this is a fun function, again. The first should... Uh, Fail and this should pass. One zero one zero one is expected. <coughs> uh, there are a couple open issues with the interfaces I just presented to you. I say I mentioned the do we need ULP based tolerance? Uh, all the interfaces here never rarely. For example, here is a tolerance. I'm the interface requires you to provide one. Does it make sense to have some defaults, like for example, uh, twice an epsilon or some kind of number as a default in some cases? I don't think so, but uh, you know, I'll go to suggestions in this case. Um, and the same for the is small, and you want to have some kind of a uh, dependency of boost mass. Uh, some of the Implementation details can be removed if you introduce dependency on boost math. I'm not sure if it's desirable. On the other hand, if we actually move this part to the boost masses itself, then it will be no brainer just to use the dependency. And um, that's about it for this part. Questions? Why don't you use just the smaller operator for is small? Yeah. What's the is small operator seems to be trivial. 
Is there some more logic in it? Or? Well, why isn't it just a comparison? Well, it's also absolute value. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that um, you can think about it and say it's actually trivial. I'm not even arguing that. It is trivial for the most part. But uh, it's just a uniform interface. Say it's, it's close or it's small. It's close, not flat, and less trivial, still not that big of a deal. But uh, you can. Uh, just uh, if you, uh, the, problem, the issue is to prevent mistakes in a user code. In a user code which is not necessarily an expert in the system, not necessarily need to think how to check the value for closeness, how to check the value, how small it is. You, for example, can introduce is small based on the small with tolerance predicate. You can define this uh, like framework of like infrastructure devel uh, designer or devel developer. You can introduce uh, predicate. And say okay, all the application developers say, okay, use this dollar and uh, predicate to check for its smallness, and you will fix some kind of tolerance. Mm -hmm. So you say this is the tolerance to use. Mm -hmm. and there are options, uh, but uh, it's not that. <coughs> Testing tools. <coughs> Testing tools has always been a major part of a boost test. So they are always uh, being used perform some test, implement some test assertion. So you want to check this two values are equal, check this two values is less, one value is less than another, check compare, uh, compare is it two, two collections are equal. How, uh, they are all macro based, so they can produce as much information as possible to the line number and, um, and give additional uh, format message in a way that it's <laughs> and um, they, they do produce the real their messages where possible. Every everything like if you have a bitwise comparison, it will show this is bit which is different. Uh, everything you can read more information online. But the um, a question I wanted to ask myself some time ago is, it, is this assertion part? Where else in my code I might find this useful? Now, is it is that, set, is that so specific <coughs> to the unit testing so that I don't have any place for it anywhere else? And the uh, answers uh, that came to this was obvious that this obvious and um, place where I want to do similar tasks is when I write my own assertion in my production. So I end up usually doing something complicated messages. Basically, if it's if it, then I generate some kind of error mm. message based on whatever assertion interface you used. Mm. But uh, it would be nice that I, if I can just take this API interface and those error messages that are being generated and uh, use it in production. And uh, I uh, find uh, I found this idea uh, compelling, so I. Uh, I uh, end up refactoring some of the post-test implementation a, bit, a little bit so that I can introduce the level of configuration. The level of configuration should be in a way that obviously we don't want the same behavior as post-test has for the unit test. We don't want it to be printed on the, on the screen probably. We want it something else. And we all actually want a different semantic <coughs> as well. There's a uh, the number of solutions for the assertions uh, more advanced, less advanced, but these uh, solutions now uh, already exist. And for, for those of you who are used to de developing the, the, the boost test, it might be very convenient to develop use the same exactly the same interfaces in production code, just have a different semantic, a little bit different semantic, what it does in case of an error. Um, we also need different implementation of it to generate this different semantic. And another bad part is that you can mix. Remember that at the very beginning I'm showing you an example where you mix unit test code with production code. Probably will not work if you try to <coughs> here because obviously different implementation and you can, you can mix them both uh, together. So the uh, what I end up with is that you only need to define two things. It's based on the marker again. Uh, you can you need to define boost test prod and boost test to implement macros. 
and includes that header. It's the same header to include but, uh, uh, to use book testing tools in unit test. And that's, that's it. Essentially, you will get different semantic with a different, uh, uh, but, but usable in production code. I myself implemented one version of it, so in a, in a header called prod prod tools. But that, that doesn't mean that someone else can't do the same. Can and you can completely rewrite this is completely different boost test tool implementation and do whatever is specific to your needs. But in most cases, you only uh, the implementation I provide also is very customizable. So you will be able to just customize it in a way. Most probably, you, you will need to do the second time, but you will be able to. So they ex this experimental bundle implementation, it has a different tool semantic from the one you used to in a unit testing. So the warrant level tools must don't do anything at all. You can't uh, really, if it's warning in production code, I don't know. Maybe you can want to show some message, maybe not. It's, there's no real reasonable default for example, what I'm trying to say. But the default uh, I chose is just do nothing. So the check level uh, uh, testing tools will throw you an exception. So uh, unlike test unit tests, we have a number of boost, test, boost check statements. The check in production code usually means if it fails. If it's assertion, <coughs> the condition fails, it means that you shouldn't can be. It's usually that's it. You need to exit from the internal something, right? And require level tools mean, uh, from uh, in this semantic means that it's very, very severe error, fatal error. And you just can't continue from this point on anymore. And, uh, and by default, I'm switch, uh, setting, you just use both assert and abort immediately right in that point. Again, you use the same interface, different semantic. I spent a lot of effort to make sure that the production version, production implementation, very, very efficient so that you don't do any extra copying for the arguments. For example, if you say there's a boost check predicate version of the tool, if you have function with number of arguments, arguments neither copied, neither, uh, no additional, uh, no call second time, the um, re recompute second time, and they were not even generated. The error part is not even generated in case if um, assertion passed. So the, uh, this is slightly different from the testing tools scenario where I do much more work even if assertion passed just because I sometimes want to report assertion passed. Um, the bundle implementation that they come up with comes with this through config with the configuration. This, the, this semantic I just described is these are only defaults. If you want to update them, so we, uh, we can do. This is three macros you can define before you include the header. We say all essentially function of one argument, error description. And uh, you can do whatever you want with it. And I'll show you example how how, uh, how to do this. So let's see some basic examples how this is gonna be used. Yeah, know that the all of this example of the implementation Part of it is implemented inside the, the unit test framework, so you will need to link with it. But this, you, you say static library there, dynamic library. I think so. Sorry, I, I'm not. I think so. You, uh, you should be able to link. It. So example number fourteen is the basic one. So here you see, first of all, the header. You say, uh, I want to do broad tools. And then I introduce boost exception header so I can report the error. They use boost, using boost exception interface. But other than that, the usage is identical. You say, I will boost check equal. So we expect the first assertion to pass, second assertion to cause an exception. The next test is a check wise. You can really use any tool, <coughs> those test tools as uh, you used to in testing environment. And here is a, I have a different semantic. So this is, I'm doing bit, bit twice equal. Here I'm compare. Actually here I am required. So at this point it should actually cause corona or So let's see. Here's our corridor. Well, I said, uh, 
this is our board that we can um, here you see the first report. This is here you see the fact that I'm using both exception allows me to incorporate file name, uh, file and position into the exception. So the error message will include file and position where exception occurred. It will say as error which function and exception failed. Detail, exactly this, as much details as we as you used to with the boost test tools in Unix test environment. And here is an except the second error with the um, bitwise equal. Yeah, I have to show is mismatch in all the position. And the last assertion is the <coughs> less equal assertion failed, causing application to abort. In this example, um, number 15, I, I wanted to show you a proof to you, some proof that there is no indeed actual, no extra work with that. <coughs> so in, 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 yeah, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to check for the predicate. So some predicate taking yeah, four, four objects of some type. And here is how you, you would do it. So you pass in these all four objects. And I am to use copy constructor which count number of copies. And I want to make sure that it's actually zero at the end. And uh, hopefully it works. Uh, let's see. Yep, no error. Well, there were no copy construction introduced by this tool execution, by this assertion execution. And the um, final example is how you would actually configure the behavior for these production tools. So there, on the, on the top, you can see I want to report warnings differently. I want to just show some message on the screen. Uh, just as simple as this. You define them before the include. And we should see here is the warning. I run it. Uh, or any good message as you would expect. So if you want to tweak the behavior of the production tools, you pretty much want to, you can do whatever you want. Okay. Any questions? Uh, First, the obvious question is, does it make sense to do this? And uh, this slight uh, problem is that I am introducing different definitions to the same thing, which is used in unit test. Well, I, theoretically, for one, they don't really intersect with each other. One is used for unit testing, one is used for the in production code. But they still kind of have one definition <coughs> violation. Depending on your hobby. I'm curious myself, but uh, I think this is fine. <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounds kind of scary. So, so you're saying you're defining the same types as in the static compiled library, but with different No, there's no guts? types. It's a whole macro. Oh, oh, macros are, are different. Macros are different. Okay, but implementation is completely different. There's no, no, no there's no different symbols. It's mm -hmm. macro definitions. So the same macro name, but different macro guts. Oh, oh no, that's completely fine. That's not an ODR violation. The ODR only cares about classes and functions. It well, care less it about depends macros. on how, how you want to look at this. I might say, oh, it's a different, the same defined, the same market defined different ranges in different scenarios. Yeah, but uh, from my perspective, it's fine, should be fine. Also, the configuration interface, uh, the one I just showed you, again, based on the macros, I found it most convenient to implement and rather simple to use. But uh, again, if someone feels that it should be configurable through some uh, some policies or more advanced techniques, I guess it's possible. Maybe it might be more difficult to do that. Not sure at this point. Any other questions? <coughs> well, looks like we have time for some uh, bonus. Uh, is this some <coughs> utilities that must have? Uh, they usually are allocated under boost test details. And they're not covered in the documentation. 
so don't explain it. It's required in the documentation. But I just wanted to show you some examples. Uh, just how that most cases very simple to trivial side. But uh, you might find it useful, so I just want to familiarize you with it. Um, some, if not many, have some alternatives to boost, but usually there's a reason why I chose to use my version. One, several reasons are either using boost version was causing too ma much dependencies, and my mine usually much simpler, straight to the point, just tools to do it. And uh, sometimes I didn't just did like whatever I see in boost for so take it with the grain of salt, but as, as it is. Here's the list. You can see it just going through the details directory. Um, I'll show you some examples. I will show, also show you some that really. Um, the algorithm, HPP, I'm not sure. There was some discussion that should be included in algorithm library. Um, So the algorithm, it's essentially uh, not very good quality, here, but uh, this is a mismatch algorithm. I'm not, I never didn't, didn't follow up why it wasn't included, but I think it's a very useful algorithm. I'm not sure why it wasn't included. Uh, mismatch algorithm, find first not off. Find first not off with a different, with a predicate, I think. Find last both. It's exactly follow the STL convention about everything. That, and, and, uh, that, um, just uh, something which is not present, definitely not present in STL. I didn't find it in Boost as well. Find last not off. And that's about it. I have a I have a unit test. I think. Here's a um, test for actually for these algorithms because I'm using internally inside the boost test, so as you can uh, see how they're being used. So this is an algorithm mismatch. I'm looking for mismatch in between these two strings. And then mismatch, mismatch, test for each. This is all tested. In what, what does mismatch do? Well, it takes two sequences and first find from mismatch between them. And it returns two pointers. OK. So String compare. Yeah, compares the strings and returns. Well, in this case, string compare, but it's, it's works in general. Right. Well, it, it, it also returns both pointers where it's mismatch. Most uh, iterators. Find not first all of the. Should, uh, uh, the semantic should more be obvious from the name of the algorithm. Why, why is mismatch different than stood mismatch? It is different. I, I, I can. It is different from the. I can go look at it right You can look at it, but I was sure. Now and your mismatch takes two pairs of iterators, and stood mismatch only takes first one, last one, and first two. So it assumes that the second sequence is as big or bigger. Oh, right. Yeah, something like this. Yes, something like this. And this version is much more reliable. And. So that's not just like lexicographical compare them, or uh, maybe uh, the class properties again. This is being discussed. There's no end. It's in the boost mailing list. There is this um, header which I'm using. Not nothing very much fancy, but um, I found it. You found you've seen already an example. And uh, I just, when I showed you an execution monitor, it defines properties. <coughs> and this is uh, read, uh, read write properties, read only properties. Uh, and um, there's, an, uh, there's a, again, unit test for it here in the test directory for the boost test. You can uh, play with it and this will work. Usually, it's, a, it's very simple, unlike many proposals where you have getter setters. This is simply just allows have a public field is a write access through dot value. So if you have a read access, you just can, can have object dot property. And it's going to write access. The write, uh, write access is dot object dot property dot value. Uh, I'm not trying to 
say this is a best solution, but uh, I found for my purposes. Mm -hmm. And where's the difference between a redrive property and a public number? Mm -hmm. um, because to, uh, to uh, for my uh, since I've been using it usually, uh, I'm working on very huge source bases. So imagine that if it's a public member, that can say object dot field is going to be in a thousand files and thousand places. So if you want to find something that updated this field somewhere, I want to see all the places that's actually being modified. But this field only modified might be two places, and it's used in a thousand, a thousand places. It will, it will be very difficult to find. My primary rational for this class, if you want, was that I want to be able to easily find all the places where the property is updated, while still making as much public property as possible, but still be able to see where it's been updated. So in places where it's been updated, it's called object.field.value, and that's it. If I need to see where it's, I just search for that. Uh, fixed mapping. I was uh, using still a lot. So I'm using it in the boost test as well. So usual user scenarios like this. You, you've got a map, you populate it at some point, then you search, produce iterator, compare iterator with the end. If it's not, you produce some <coughs> default values. So I, just, I found this part pattern pretty p common. And I end up with this fixed mapping class, uh, which the easiest way to show you is to show you how it's being used in boost test, actually. It's, um, here, yeah. Here's the fixed mapping, which maps string name to the log level. So you define instance, you define a default value if you want, and then on that later, later on it's just square bracket access, and it will always work. Don't need to check any errors. Always works straightforward. Nothing. Uh, uh, but I found this pattern rather useful. I'm using a number of places in boost test and uh, in my, my own production code as well. So if you're interested, uh, feel free to use it. It has some uh, compile time limit for the number of elements you can provide in the structure, but it's very definable. Essentially, you, like usually in boost headers, <coughs> you have some max. I think it's, I don't remember exactly what the, the name of the variable. Somewhere here, yeah, max map size. So the default is 20, and then just you can provide up to 20 elements. <coughs> and to generate it as none. Well, based on boost preprocessor library, it will generate all the constructors you need. The uh, lazy Austrian, I can actually have an example for you <coughs> in this case. Uh, the idea is that sometimes you have some. Uh, temporary variables, which you may or may not show later on. So in my case, it was, uh, you, we've got some uh, uh, test tools, which being, for the most part, everything is done in the macro. But report itself is done inside the library. So I need to pass all the information to the library. Even if assertion passed, I just need to collect the statistics, and sometimes it depends on the log level, I need to report it, but it all depends at runtime. So at compile time, I need to collect this information, but sometimes I need to collect it to some degree. I don't want to go through printing all the values, only to find out at the last moment I actually need them all, any of them. So here's where lazy Austrian comes. It just, it's a essentially a simple utility which uh, generates expression template for output operation. And uh, you can pass it, and then once you actually need to produce an output, you can say, okay, go ahead, produce an output. And it, that, this is all what it does. Um, and I have an example. This is number 18. So, you know, I'm generating some. So, I have some simple instance. It's not this I have to be done with this. I just have this helper so I can use it. Uh, so 
So say okay, print this, print this, and print some. I don't need this too, I just want to show this not only strings you can print. You can print anything as usual. So with uh, I was doing, right? So and uh, the interesting part is this operation, print operation does <coughs> not occur at this point. It actually occurs at this point. So you can pass it around, do whatever you want with it. Because this is it's a done with base class. So no, this is gonna be virtual function code. It is can ignore it as much as So how does this differ from uh, like an O string string? Well all strings team will perform all the operation immediately, right? All the formatting, all the all nine yards. You'll produce the final buffer. You may not produce in the standard output for you immediately, but it's all for formatting for you is gonna be done easily. So this will like store two in the structure somewhere. Yes. So at the minimum you're copying whatever's been given to you, but you're not No, it's the, the it's formatting. done at this point it's done all by reference. So Okay, then uh, what if uh, what I'm printing there at the two is the result of the function car foo, paren, paren, that returns a temporary? Uh, I understand. Well, yeah. I didn't need it. But if you find it, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we can enhance so, so you can't print te temporaries from evaporating. They have to be at least L values here. Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. I was wondering how you're doing like, no, impossible I'm not, magic. <laughs> I'm not doing impossible magic. If we want to do some impossible magic, we can think about it. Uh, it's a, and most of what I'm trying to show you at the moment is very simple, down to the earth utility. Whatever you, you want to use it, go ahead. But, uh, it's, uh, for the purposes I found, it's, it's rather useful. So, as expected, there is nothing printed. Print only once phase one is complete. Here's your error message. It doesn't prove much, but believe me, there are no output operations executed before you actually go through the output. Uh, name params, I can show problems. Uh, the, the last one, uh, null stream HPP. Uh, for the most part, you don't have need to use it. I just want to show you there's a number of cases where you want to have some O stream which doesn't do anything. There's already an alternative in a boost IO streams. Uh, boost IO streams, which pretty much does the same, slightly more advanced, uh, heavy, if you want. But because this implementation, I mean, like a couple lines of code. <coughs> this, that's about it. Compare with the uh, IOSTREAM slightly more, but otherwise, may not the same we have been doing before. Um, so I don't think so. This, I provide all the operators you need. I will provide all the operators you need. I mean, I provide the operators with L or less the stream on the left side, with anything on the right side. So, I'm not sure you need any operation. But possibly it fails in some scenarios. You can come up and you can investigate. It works with boost test, the old, and it is being used in boost test. In every single test testing tool is using laser, <coughs> so it's quite working. It's thoroughly tested. It's only tested. Uh, so the null stream, the RTTI again. It's a tiny, maybe like ten lines of code. Uh, it's pretty much here. It is. That's it. At some point, I needed information. Uh, as you know, that RTTI is actually may not be available in some scenarios. Plus, it's uh, Maybe expensive compared to me. Just want something very, very lightweight, so where I can uh, have uh, RTTI without no RTTI support. And uh, I show you, I can show you an example. I use it in a different component of boost test in a runtime library. But uh, essentially, <coughs> this is what it is. You can uh, here's the main. So you have a function foot that I want to pass int and double. And uh, you can do switch on a type, or you can do switch, actual switch, I just help on micros. If you, can, you can, if you want it to look like a switch statement, you can use this macro <coughs> to look like a switch statement. And uh, it does not depend on actual RTTI. 
So if you don't work, it has some limitation if you will not work probably in between, if you want to use it in between shared libraries. But if you want to use it within your library, within the same you know, static library, within the same shared library, within the same executable, it works fine. I've tested a number of scenarios and I use it myself as well. I can uh, run this example. So it says int double and two is expected. So the first was called with int, uh, it print int, then it was called with double, it prints double, and then here it goes to, in the second case, and print, so it prints two. Okay, print, here is supposed to be second case, int double. Right? Uh, set color, uh, I don't know, many, many of you probably don't know it, but this test now supports Printing uh, output in a colorful, very nice, uh, well, very nice, but color, colorful output if you want to. There's so minus minus color, command line switch if you want to. But uh, while working on that, I found that there is no standard ready to do this. So I wrote my one myself. And if you need to do something like this in your code, you're free to do it. Free to do it. So the Code looks like uh, this. Is, uh, the manipulator is sticky. Uh, I'll need probably a couple more minutes. And then, uh, uh, so it says, I want a bright yellow, blue, hello world. I'll show you an example. It doesn't really work that nice on Windows, but I can show you an example in FreeBSD. Uh, it's a FTTI example. This is a color example. Yeah. It's sticky, so the next message shows you. Mm -hmm. This is a. It's uh, sticky because it's terminal, right? So, this is a, um, this is a way to do, make it scoped, if you want, essentially. There's a interface uh, inside the set color. There's a um, scope set color. Essentially, it's turned it on and off. So I assume you're just using, was it, ANSI escape sequences I think so. on Unix. You can actually get this to work on Windows. This is one of the things I did in my personal library. Um, you just need set console text attribute. Uh, unfortunately, Windows by default, for some reason, does not interpret ANSI escape sequences, but you can make a Windows API call that says, hey, any text that I print from now on, make it multicolor. Uh, it, it works. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look, but usually yeah. uh, Windows users don't. We were just not literate, I see. Okay, so the um <laughs> of course this trivial simple I don't go there. The last example I want to show you is the name of the parameters. There's a boost parameter that I've read already. Uh, in a boost. I was objecting to trying to accept it. So, and I still <coughs> personally find it, no objection to David, but I find it a piece of over engineering. So, I have my own name param, like 200 lines of code, unlike <coughs> whatever kilobytes whose param the libraries. I'm pretty sure that they do much more than I am able to do. And I, this 200 lines of code allows me to do everything I ever need. So in this case, there is a full function which takes name parameters. I'm familiar with the concept, right? So this full function takes two optional one required. So section takes uh, parameters. Well, if name it has some. It has it has name. It will doing something. Otherwise, it uh, has the default value if you need to. If this is not provided. And then it called limitation, which will bring and the value is actually non type keywords. It can be anything. So it will pass it. And this is actually an extension, which uh, I found it useful in my, again, from my own experience. I use these interfaces a lot. I like the interface, so I use it a lot. So I found that sometimes I have one function, then I have some wrap around that function, which does something with parameters. But I'm, I don't want to pass this parameter anymore. I, I, I want this parameter. I already processed that parameter. I don't need to do uh, the, the internal as a function inside to do it in the second time. 
So here's an example. I have full extended, which is a name has to just do something else. And then it erases that parameter. I don't think this parameter library loves it. And then it will call, call the library and say here is the examples of usage. So it's usual, you can call it any number of parameters, optional, with any order. In this case, we'll not, we will not print anything. We just say, I believe it's just say I'm setting index number one to the value 10. In this case, it will print something. In this case, we'll use index default. This line does not pass the values. It actually will fail to compile as a desirable. And uh, this function will print this statement instead of that statement. So this one is not going to print. Well, setting an element to 1 to 10. There is no processing commands on a message. Here's the processing command set, send element 2 to 8, it's second call. Third call, send an element 0, <coughs> index 0 by default to 1.2. Notice all different types. And then finally, do some extra work before processing commands and mm -hmm. this different command, and set an element to and into the string. The biggest, well, if you want a difference from well, uh, ideology of boost parameter library, it, is that so the optional parameters, this solution will not cause compile time errors. And the boost parameter library will cause some, some, something like this. From my perspective, uh, there is no real difference. I mean, if, it, if I refer to the optional parameter and fail to provide it, I'll get error on the first time I use it. And for any practical purposes, it's exactly the same. Uh, well, I, I guess, uh, but uh, you probably have a heavy price for this compiler. <coughs> and I wanted to run time stuff. Definitely wanted everything to be at runtime. All the checks to be at runtime. I wanted this code to look at as a runtime usual stuff. But uh, I'm not trying to stand in. I just say this is my version. If you find it easy for use. What else? Basic string, which is string. Runtime, it's an alternative to runtime command uh, command line arguments. I found again this library to, to my taste. So I have my own. An iterator is a couple of iterators, like string iterators that will allow to iterate string by st line, by line by line iterators in there. Or token trade is slightly different from uh, token interface use tokenizer. Other than that, that's it.